This is a reading from the notebooks by Maria Valtorta, 1945 to 1950. This is a, a continuation of the September and November reading from 1950, uh, which is a continuation of chapter 2. Glory be to you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to the little ones. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. It comes from those out of human respect or hunger for donations, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19, become blind and go against justice. Errors joined to the weakness of man who remains man, even if he has put on the robes of religion. Errors which have sent servants of God to the stake or to jail, and which still apply chains, which, even if they are not material, certainly continue to be chains to the twofold freedom of the individuals chosen as servants by their Lord, the freedom of man, which, provided he does not do things against the state or his fellows, which are punishable under the law, is sacred, and the special freedom of the servant of God to serve God as he requests of his servant. Before, long before Jesus, the voice of the prophets had predicted that the peoples that did not know the Lord would become his people, in place of the one that did not want to recognize him. Jesus many centuries later, warned his people that the Gentiles would surpass many of them in justice, and he offered an example of the way to treat the Gentiles and sinners to lead them to the way, the truth, and the life. And yet, the apostles themselves, directly instructed by the word and example of the Master, because of their ever-recurring pride in being Jews, impeded dealings with the Gentiles. The example of Peter with the centurion Cornelius Acts chapter 10, should show everyone how pride can slow down the conquest of souls and or pave the way for certain souls not to come to life. God had to intervene with a miracle to persuade the apostle that God does not distinguish between persons, but in any nation, those who fear him and practice justice are acceptable to him. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 35. Jesus and before him the prophets had clearly instructed people about the destiny of Christ. And yet, when the evening of Holy Thursday came, though they were fortified by purification and the Eucharist given to them by the eternal pontiff, human weakness, which is not cancelled out by consecration, brought them to flee in fear and shame and to deny. And it was precisely Peter, the successor of Jesus in the government of the church, who denied him. And later, though assailed by the Holy Spirit on different occasions, he showed a lack of understanding towards his brothers in the priestly ministry and was weak to the point of manifesting duplicity in his way of life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 12. Out of fear of prompting criticism or enmity. Man is man, like newborn babes. 1 Peter chapter 2, chapter 2 verse 2. Longing for sincere spiritual milk to grow and become a chosen lineage, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and the people of God. So Peter changed from being a man to being holy, heroically holy, ever holier, truly becoming another Christ by assiduous effort. But first he was man, as Paul was a man, in whom the law of the flesh, Romans chapter 7, verse 23, struggled against that of the Spirit a man who, after being snatched up to the third heaven, still experienced the blows of the angel of Satan, the spur of the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. As man, many other servants of God existed, martyrs of their selfhood, because they overcame this self and were regenerated in Christ. How often must I forgive? Peter asked Jesus one day. And Jesus replied, Seventy times seven. That is, an unlimited number of times, for Jesus knew that man, even if regenerated by grace, even if nourished by the Eucharist, even if confirmed in the grace of confirmation, even if elevated by the priesthood, would always be man, man in need of compassion and forgiveness, because he was prone to err. And soon, within the church, out of pride or lukewarmness, separations and heresies arose. There were Gnostics, Nicolaitans, Simonites and Biliamites, and later antipopes, the dark period of the papal court in Avignon, and the even darker one of nepotism and all that was associated with it. 
a permanent star. Like every star, the church, too, has its phases. An undying flame, like every flame, it alternates between flaring up and flaring and flickering weakly. But since its head, Jesus, and its soul, the Holy Spirit, are eternal and most perfect, and eternal and infinite is their power and will, so it can experience momentary phases of descent and weakening, but it cannot fall entirely or fade out completely. On the contrary, after one of these phases, like a person shaken from drowsiness or strengthened by a powerful medicine, it reawakens and becomes vigorous in its service, an admirable, universal mission. And it should be stated that precisely in what is painful to be seen within it, momentary laxity or persecution by enemies lies the cause of its new ascendant phase. Those who are prone to pride or criticism and to judging everyone except themselves will say after these words, but it is something supernatural. It cannot then decline in its perfection. The former will say that, and the latter will say, if it were the way they say it is, it would be perfect in all its members. But, and they will cite case after case, more or less deplorable in reality. I say in reality, because on occasion something may appear not to be good, and in substance not be wicked. And both will err, for the church is indeed a society or congregation of chosen members, regenerated for grace by baptism, confirmed and perfected in the virtues and gifts by confirmation, nourished by the Eucharist, cleansed by the absolution following upon penance, and assisted in the mission of spouses and creators by marriage, or in the other one of pastors of souls by holy orders, and in addition, the church, as the mystical body, is holy in its head, soul, law, and doctrine, and in many of its members. This is true. Nor are the lower members to be disdained, because in many instances the members that seem to be weakest are the most necessary. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 22. Since by their humble, holy, hidden lives, led and offered for the whole society of Christians, they contribute to increasing the spiritual treasures of the whole mystical body. And, moreover, God has arranged the body in such a way as to give greater honor to the members that did not possess it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 24. That is, He often draws the sanctifiers, those who attract numberless souls to God, by their action and example from those who are the least in the mystical body, without rank or ordination, but rich in justice, because they identify themselves with Christ in every one of their actions. Indeed, the Church as a society of the faithful, who are truly such, starting from its most holy head, is holy, and holiness descending from the head and circulating through all his members will never be completely lacking. But the members are not all holy, for man is man, even if Catholic, and remains man, even if he belongs to the Church in any of its parts. When many members become more rational man than divinized man, then the church experiences a period of descent, from which it later rises again. For the church itself understands that it is necessary to rise up to confront external and internal enemies. The open enemies already at the service of the adversary and the Antichrist, and the crafty enemies who corrode the edifice of faith and consequently cause charity to grow chill by wanting to offer a new version of the mysteries and miracles of God by means of those depths of Satan and of the spirit of the world, of which mention has already been made. Those who are prone to pride should not say, The Church cannot experience this because it will always be holy. It has been said, both by the divine word speaking to the prophets and by the divine incarnate word of the Father speaking to his chosen ones, that great abominations such as jealousy and horrible abominations such as the worship of human idols, and knowledge devoid of wisdom is one of them, and perversion with the worship of what should not be venerated, will come into the temple. Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 1 through 17. And that after Christ is killed, and when the people denying him is no longer his people, the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed by a people that will come, whose purpose will be devastation, and when it is over, the desolation decreed will come, and there will no longer be hosts and sacrifices, and in the temple will be the abomination of desolation, 
which will last until the end. Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 to 27. And further, as direct confirmation by the word of the words of his announcers, the prophets, when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, then the tribulation will be great as never before since the beginning of the ages. And after the tribulation, they will see the Son of Man, Matthew chapter 24, verses 15, 21, 29 to 30. And the charity which will grow cold in too many hearts will be one of the precursory signs of the end. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. It has been said, and it will come. Open your spiritual eyes to, to read the predictions of heaven. If you open them, you will read the truth and see what the true signs of the end are and the fact that it is already occurring. For him who is eternal, a century is less than a minute. It has not been stated then that it will be tomorrow, but if the path is still long in order for everything to be fulfilled, the things which are already happening tell you that the final process has now begun. The great abominations, jealousy, where there should be only fraternal charity, excessive love for human knowledge, where there should be only faithful love for wisdom, the source of revelation, compromises between what offers earthly gain and what offers supernatural gain in order to receive immediate gain. Christ slain in too many souls, too many from his people who have come to deny their Savior. These are the preparatory things. Then the people that will come for the purpose of devastating. Another prophet said, When the people from the north, a great tumult from the lands of the north, behold, coming from the north, Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 22, chapter 10 verse 22, and chapter 50 verse 41. The two predictions are so clear that it suffices to raise one's gaze and be able to see and want to see in order to understand. And what will it devastate? Oh, not just buildings and towns, but above all faith, morality, and souls. And not, and not all the souls devastated will be common souls, and the sacrifices and hosts will be lacking, for freedom of worship will no longer be allowed, and many will fear being seized for this reason. Already, though the devastation and persecution are not yet taking place, many deny the way previously chosen, for the abomination is spreading like evil wildfire, and charity is growing cold as the false prophets arise, as the false prophets arise about whom Christ speaks in Matthew 24 and Paul in 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2. For the time being only these, but afterwards the one they proceed will come, the Antichrist, for whom they will have prepared the way by weakening charity, just as the Baptist prepared the ways for Christ by teaching charity, of which he was full in being filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 15, as the indispensable means to be able to unite to Christ and lead the life of God. For the Baptist's teachings on charity, see Luke chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. In reality, charity is the bond which keeps the Catholic community united to God and to brothers and sisters. In and through charity, there appear union and the nourishment of souls and their sanctification and that of ever new souls. If charity comes to be lacking, it is replaced by self-love, and the difference between the two loves is as follows. True, holy love, as commanded and counseled by God, is a search for God. It is a recognition of His omnipotence, visible in all things. It is elevation to God, and everything contributes to this elevation for those possessing charity in themselves, which is active mercy as regards all the needs of one's neighbor, for in all neighbors, charity brings us to see brothers or sisters, and we perceive Jesus in them. Jesus suffering with the sufferings of the poor, the sick, and the persecuted, or suffering because a son of the Father is becoming a prodigal son, leaving the Father's house in search of a false well-being, or suffering because someone doubts he has a father, and it is necessary to persuade him that there is an extremely good father, so that he will not fall into desolation and sin. Self-love, on the other hand, is the search for ourselves. It is successive love for oneself. It is action performed to glorify oneself in the eyes of the world. It is then concupiscence of the flesh, 
concupiscence of the eyes, and pride of life. And from this plant with three branches there later comes vainglory, hardness of heart, haughtiness, longing for human praise, hypocrisy, a spirit of domination, and the conviction that one can judge oneself on one's own, shrugging aside every command or counsel of love and of those speaking in the name of love. They believe they are free and kings, because, according to them, no one is better than they, for, in their own opinion as well, they are already established on the summits of knowledge and power, but they are worse slaves than anyone else, to themselves and to God's enemy, and to the servants of the enemy of God, slaves, servants, naked and blind, slaves to themselves, and servants or slaves to the enemy and enemies of God, naked as regards the beautiful robes, the robes of the marriage to wisdom, the white robes for the heavenly banquet, and to go on celebrating the Lamb, blind, or at least nearsighted, because they have ruined their spiritual vision with useless human investigations. They become like this because they have renounced their primogenitor, that is, the highest filiation, the one coming from God, for a poor plate of lentils, earthly food. A plate of lentils is the replacement of sapiential, supernatural works, especially the great revelation, which should be accepted and believed without half measures. A plate of lentils is to replace this with scientific books, which, no matter how perfect, are always books written by a man. They may thus seem clearer and certainly more comprehensible for those able to read the letter alone, remain on the surface of something for those who cannot penetrate further because of their own heaviness. But they do not transform man. They do not lead him upwards. Inspired books, on the other hand, those books whose author is God, for those able to read them, are a means of transformation and union in God and with God and of elevation. All that comes from God is a means of elevation, transformation, and more intimate union with God. Miracles themselves, of different kinds, and especially the miracles of healing of bodies and spirits, are a means of transformation and union with God. How many of the incredulous and sinful were able to be turned into believers and redeemed persons through the wonder of a miracle? Miracles should not be denied out of deference to rationalism. Neither the miracle of creation, nor that of healing of a soul, or the flesh. Matter was brought out of nothing, and ordered towards its sole purpose by God. A dead soul, or one ill with an incurable spiritual disease, was healed by God, through one means or another, but still by God. A body condemned to die can be healed by God, always by God, even if he makes use of an apparition, or a just person to convert and heal a spirit, or of special trust in a saint to heal the flesh. Let the rationalists manage to believe. Reason is a great thing. It is a great thing to be a rational creature, but the spirit is a greater thing, and to be a spiritual creature is greater. That is, those who know they have a spirit and set it in the first place as the king of their selfhood and as the most select thing of all. For if reason helps man to be a man and not a beast, the spirit, when it is king of the self, makes man the adoptive son of God, gives him a likeness to God, and enables him to share in his divinity and eternal goods. Let the Spirit then reign over reason, and the flesh over humanity, and let a rationalism not sorry, let the Spirit then reign over reason and the flesh or humanity, and let a rationalism and let a rationalism not reign, which denies or seeks to explain what should be believed by faith which on being explained, indeed, in the attempt at explanation, is damaged, and faith is damaged, if not slain. Let the rationalists manage to see. Let them put down the opaque lens of rationalism, which will be of no use to them, but on the contrary lead them to see altered truths, just as a lens not suitable for a weakened eye leads one to see even worse. Those who lean towards rationalism are already weakened in spiritual sight, when they choose it, moreover, they place unsuitable lenses before their weakened vision and see poorly in all respects. Let them manage to see, and see clearly, and see goodness clearly, see God and His continuous, perfect action in maintaining creation, which received life through His will, 
and restoring health and life where death is already certain. How can those who want to explain creation and life as autogenesis and polygenesis deny that the Almighty could make even what He was able to create at the beginning, which was not even matter, but just chaos, and later there were only limited, imperfect things? Is it logical, purely logical and reasonable, and reasonable for us to accept the miracle of self-ordering chaos, generating the cell by itself? and the idea that the cell evolves into a species which, is, which evolves into others that are increasingly perfect and numerous, while God is described as unable to make all of creation by Himself? Is it logical and reasonable to maintain the evolution of the species, indeed of one given species, as far as the animal form, which is most perfect because it is endowed with speech and reason, even these alone, when we see that for millennia, all other animal creatures have not acquired reason and speech, though it coexisting with man. For millennia, every animal has been as it was made. There may have been structural reduction and crosses whereby new hybrid races emerged from the first ones created, but over the course of periods and millennia, the bull has never been seen to have ceased being such, or the lion, or the dog, that has also lived with man for many centuries nor over the course of millennia, and in contact with man, whose gestures they can certainly imitate, while unable, unable, however, to learn speech. Have monkeys ever been seen to become men, at least animal men? It is lower creatures themselves that, with the evidence of the facts, contradict the lucubrations of those cultivating exclusively rational knowledge. They are as they were. They testify to the omnipotence of God with the variety of species, but they have not evolved. They have remained as they were, with their instincts, their natural laws, and their special mission, which is not ever useless, even if it may seem to be. God does not perform useless or totally harmful works. The snake's venom is itself useful and has a reason for existence. Let the rationalists manage to see let the lenses of scientific rationalism be removed, and let them see in the light of God, by means of the divine word who spoke through the mouths of the patriarchs and prophets of the ancient temple, and the saints, mystics, and contemplatives of the new temple, from whom one spirit has always revealed and recalled hidden matters and past matters, altered in their truth in passing from mouth to mouth. Above all, let them see by means of the incarnate word and light of the world, Jesus the teacher of teachers, who has not changed a syllable in the revelation contained in the book, but as omnipotence and truth. He knew everything in the completeness of truth, and indeed confirmed it and restored it as regards its meaning, which was sometimes intentionally deformed by the rabbis of Israel to its original form, which is the only true one. To seek to add to what wisdom has revealed, tradition has passed on, and the word has confirmed and explained, is to add tinsel to gold. It is not the tokens of science that open the gates of the kingdom of heaven, but the golden coins of faith in the revealed truths, the golden coins of hope in the eternal promises, and the golden coins of charity, practiced because it has been believed in and hoped for that give the spirits of the just, and later the bodies and spirits of the just, their place in the eternal city of God. It will never be sufficiently asserted that knowledge is straw, which fills but does not nourish, and smoke which obscures but does not illuminate, and spiritual poison which kills, and weeds yielding the fruit of false prophets with new words and new theories which are not the divine word or divine doctrine. Elsewhere, where what has been mentioned above is not present, there are some who seem to be alive and are dead, that is, those possessing only the appearance of what they ought to be, in all respect like a beautiful, ornate statue, which is, however, lacking in sensation and cannot communicate to others the life it does not have. Mouths, speaking because they cannot keep silent, but which are not convincing, not convincing because the power which is persuasive is lacking in their words. They themselves are not convinced and cannot convince. Mechanical instruments that even speak well in terms of eloquence, but soullessly. There have always been such. They are the ones with a mistaken vocation, enthusiasts at the outset, 
their enthusiasm then gradually fades out, and they lack the courage to withdraw. Better one pastor fewer than a pastor who looks alive and is spiritually dead or very close to dying. A living one could take his place to provide life, but the falsest form of human respect keeps them from confessing openly, I am not capable anymore, and I will withdraw. There have always been such. Judas Iscariot is their prototype. It would have been better for him to withdraw rather than remain and arrive at the supreme crime. He who looks back after setting his hand to the plow is not fit for the kingdom of God, the divine master said, and it is better for one who is unfit to withdraw rather than cause many to perish because even more cause even more to grumble and do harm to the priesthood by the scandal occasioned. The multitude generalizes and sees evil more readily than good. When people, with, when people understand they have died to the mission, they should withdraw, but they should not allow the multitudes to judge, generalizing and harming the whole group. The branches destined to provide sap to the fruits should be cut off if they become sterile, because not only are they useless, but they take strength away from the plant, just to adorn themselves with pompous, useless leaves. Among the things created perfect by God, there was always a part that was unable to remain such. The first defection was in the angelic host, and it is an impenetrable mystery that this could have happened in spirits created in grace, who saw God and knew His essence and attributes, His works and plans for the future. They still rebelled and did not manage to remain in their state of grace and change from spirits of light, living in joy and supernatural knowledge, into spirits of darkness, living in horror. The second defection was that of the first parents, and it too is inexplicable. How could it happen that two innocents, who enjoyed God's numberless benefits, and because of their fortunate state of grace and other gifts, were in a position to know and love God like no other humans, except the Son of Man and His mother, for they were filled with innocence and grace, were capable of listening to and obeying the tempter and preferring Him to heeding the voice of God who taught them lovingly and asked them for one single act of obedience, an easy form of obedience, for they had no need to pick that fruit in order to be satisfied in every appetite. They had everything. God had made them rich with all they needed to be happy and healthy in body and spirit. They still rebelled, disobeyed, and did not manage to remain in their state of grace and changed from creatures living in joy and supernatural knowledge into unfortunates in spirit, heart, mind, and members. The latter were wearied by work. Their minds were frightened by the difficulties of the immediate future and the impending and eternal future. Their hearts were broken by the slaying of one son and the perversity of another. Their spirits were discouraged, now immersed in the haze of sin, which kept them from comprehending the loving guidance of the Father Creator. The third great, mysterious, and inexplicable defection is that of Judas Iscariot, who spontaneously wanted to belong to Christ, who enjoyed his love for three years and fed on his word, and who, because he was disappointed in his concupiscent dreams, sold him for thirty denarii, changing from an apostle, that is, chosen for the highest spiritual dignity, into the betrayer of the friend, the deicide, and suicide. These are the greatest defections, but there are always some, though lesser, for man is man, for what is created is never eternally perfect, as is the Creator, except for the heavenly kingdom, where only spirits confirmed in grace and no longer subject to sin have their dwelling, and except for the Son of Man and His Mother, the former, because He was the God-man, and therefore as his human person was united to his divine person, so his divine perfections were joined to his human perfections. The latter, because she responded to the extraordinary gifts with which God filled her from the moment of conception with good will and faithfulness reaching a power which none of the saints has ever reached or will ever reach.